really, really happy to have the support of Cargill Market Sense with us. You've probably met the team um, from Cargill uh, at the conference already. They're they're a pretty cool group, pretty fun group, keeping us on our toes. Um, so it gives me much pleasure to introduce Edward Brzezinski to you, Grain Advisory Service Lead Market Analyst for Cargill Market Sense. So he's going to talk about making market sense. Ed started with Cargill as a grain buyer in, oh geez, Balcares, Saskatchewan, and became an advisor in 2017. He currently lives with his partner, Lisa, and family in Battleford, Saskatchewan. That one I can pronounce. Ed has been a member of the Cargill team for more than five years. He was raised in rural Ontario and learned the value of hard work at a young age in the dairy barn and tobacco fields. And he told me that he recognized Andrea Gall, our chair, because they went to high school together. He's like, I know that girl. So that's very cool. Ed moved to Western Canada in 2005 and spent 10 years working in the energy industry. During that time, he earned a degree in economics and business management from the University of Calgary. Ed has written research papers on optimizing economic regulation and forecasting commodity prices based on inventory levels. I think we'll have to get together and write some cool papers together because I love writing too. <laughs> so please put your hands together and welcome Edward Brochinski to the stage. Hello everyone, thanks for being here today with me, and uh, this is a great, great venue, so um, thank you to everybody who's uh, put us up here today. Um, as Heather said, I'm Ed Broshinsky, and I'm the lead market analyst with Cargill Market Sense. Um, believe it or not, there was a time that I considered myself a grain marketing expert. But over the last couple of years, I've realized that experts are made to be humbled. And therefore, I now consider myself a student of the market. I'm always learning, and I have the pleasure of taking the world apart and putting it back together every single day with Cargill Market Sense. But why am I here? Well, it's the same reason you're all here. It's to manage risk in our operations. It's to improve profitability, and it's to generally just feel more confident in running the operations and achieving the goals that we have for today, tomorrow, and over the next five years. That's why we're all here today, and I'm here to tell you, and I hope that after this presentation, the one thing that you take back is that when it comes to marketing, market sense is how. So I want to ask yourself, or I want to look out at the big team out here, and I, I know I, I recognize, some, I, I recognize uh, Sterling Hilton. He's the, he's the guy that puts the crop at the ground, takes the risk, and puts it all on a line to feed Canadian families. I know Michael's here taking the world apart just like me as an analyst. He's drilling down to find out what is the operating, uh, what is the environment that we operate in in today's farming culture. There's a big team in front of us. There's Young budding agronomists from, from the universities and the colleges that are um, coming up as the next generation. It's a great team. We're all professionals, laser focused on what we do best, and we're all doing it to put food on the plates of our families and to grow and prosper individually and as an industry. But I got to ask you, how do you cut through, when it comes to markets anyway, how are you cutting through the noise? How are you gaining insights? And then when I say insights, I, you think about Wiley Coyote, and he's, um, he's going to get the roadrunner, and he's, looking, he's gathering information from the world around him in the badlands of wherever he is, southern, in the, in the desert somewhere. He's gathering information. He's looking at plans from Acme, and uh, a light goes on in his head. That's insight, right? He, all the information is in the insight. That's all the stuff. That's just all the noise. The insight is like, oh, this is how I'm going to put this information to use for me to get the roadrunner. That is insight, right? So how are you gaining that insight? And how are you finding a trusted partner? We all need partners. We all need sounding boards uh, to uh, gain confidence in the marketing decisions that we make. And I'm here to tell you market sense is how. Uh, so as an analyst, my reputation is built on being straightforward and upfront, 
giving you the straight goods. So this is how we're going to do it today. We're going to tell you how Market Sense is structured. Uh, we're going to talk, give you a little bit of a little bit of a market update. Um, talk about how Market Sense views the current environment that we're in. Then I'm going to give you a story, good old-fashioned Western. There's going to be tears, laughter, lots of money. It's important. That's important about Westerns. Um, and we're going to talk, in that story, it, it should be informative too, and hopefully you'll learn how to use, you know, we've talked about options in this, in this uh, presentation quite a bit, and hopefully I'll help you to learn the basics of one of the options that Cargill offers. And then finally, we're going to wrap it all up and give it away as a gift, the presentation from me to you. So Market Sense is how? So what is Market Sense? Well, Market Sense is a consulting service offered by Cargill, uh, offered to the Canadian farmer, and the, the, the purpose is to uh, uh, give insights to the farmer and information uh, to help the farmer achieve his goals on the farm and feel more confident. And I know what you're going to say, oh, Cargill Market Sense. You're wrong. I'm telling you right now, you're wrong. And the reason you're wrong is because it's not true. If you're on the Cargill Market Sense program, you are not required to deliver any grain to Cargill. Just want to put that out there right now. The reason that is the case is because we truly believe that a prosperous relationship, a prosperous business relationship is founded on trust, and there can be no, um, there can be no conflict of interest. And as a result, our advisors, all the advisors around Canada that service farm clients, are incentivized by uh, signing up clients and retaining that business, keeping their farmers happy. That's it. They don't have any incentive to buy grain or, or do anything else. They want to keep their farmers happy. And Cargill truly believes that if the farmer is prosperous, then the environment, business environment will be prosperous. And you know how it works. I mean, we have a big crop. That's going to be good for everybody, right? The farmer is going to be good for the grain companies, it's going to be good for the chemical guys, the equipment guys. Big, everybody wants a bumper crop, come on. But also, in the market sense side of things, or the marketing side of things, even when there's a poor crop, right, even when we had a drought like last year, uh, if we can help the farmer survive through that, if we can help him uh, manage his operations so that he can get through the tough years as well, then we're going to be there with him uh, through him or her, uh, through the the good years as well. We're all going to be prosperous. So that's the philosophy. Trusting relationships lead to better insights, better recommendations, and better business. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the philosophy. Where does where do I fit in as Ed, the market analyst? So I, I disseminate and I distribute information. I, I create the insights and the strategies for the Canadian team. We have a group of advisors all across the prairies that go on farm and help deliver customized, structured, tailored risk management plans for the farmer. And, and I'm the guy who, um, who, who cuts through the noise, so to speak, right? So I'm going to do a little bit of that for you now. We're going to talk about what's going on in the market. <laughs> There's a lot. There'll be time for some questions later, so if I don't cover everything, which I won't, um, you can ask me your specific questions afterwards. But there's a few things up here that I thought, uh, they're not the most important things necessarily, but I think they're the drivers right now. Okay, there's a lot of important things in the market. Uh, this is what I think is driving the market right now today. Uh, we're going to talk about supply chains. You know, we've had disruptions based on the war in the Black Sea. Um, COVID lockdowns are continuing to disrupt supply chains. We're going to talk a little bit about government policy. Government policy is interesting because uh, sometimes it doesn't make sense, but it also creates opportunity. And uh, we're seeing that now, and we're going to talk about that. Weather, obviously weather matters, right? Um, South America is in a drought right now in Argentina. We'll talk a bit about that. The Canadian prairies aren't out of the woods yet either. And uh, inflation and interest rates, the boogeyman that has infiltrated every aspect of our business. So we'll start with that. U.S. two-year interest rates. That's the proxy that I'm using in this slide to, to when I talk about interest rates. There's all sorts of interest rates, okay? That's one thing. It's not this one interest rate. There's a 30-day, a 90-day, a two-year, a 10-year, a 30-year. There's mortgage rates. There's car loan rates. There's student loan rates. You know, there's all sorts, credit card rates. There's all sorts of interest rates. 
All interest rates are benchmarked to the risk-free rate, which is considered the government. Whatever the credit rating of the government is, that's the best credit rating because they can print money. So they can obviously pay their debt. They just print more money. We can't do that, so we always uh, pay a little bit of a premium to what the government can borrow at. But this is why I use the two-year interest rate because it's kind of a, a good intersection. Um, the Federal Reserve, when they talk about interest rates, uh, you know, oh, they're going to raise the interest rate next month. Uh, they are talking about the 30-day rate, the short-term overnight rate, um, which is uh, it, it's, it's overnight, but then they, they quote it as a 30-day rate. Um, that's, that's what the central banks control. But the reality is, if you want to lend money to somebody, uh, you control that. I'm not going to be like, oh, um, you know, my friend here, Bill, wants to borrow 100 bucks. I'm not going to call up Jerome Powell at the Federal Bank. What, what can, what's the interest rate? What can I charge him? No, I decide that. I decide what I lend my money out at. And so, so there is a market-based component to interest rates, and, and this two-year com combines that together, so that's why I'm using that. We can talk about that later. And so <laughs> obviously, it's a, it's a bull market, right? Great. No, wait, it's interest rates. No, we don't want a bull market in, in interest rates. That's, that's not a good thing. But anyway, 4.5%. Um, why are interest rates so high? Well, it's because of inflation. That's what they all tell us anyway. And uh, this is U.S. consumer price inflation measured on a monthly basis. The last reading was 7.7% on an annualized uh, basis. So I heard it asked, or I think there was a question from Michael in one of the recent slides, or one of the recent presentations. <laughs> I don't think we were able to get to it, and, and I really wanted to answer it today, is why uh, is there a... Uh, an intersection between interest rates and inflation. The contemporary idea is that uh, if interest rates um, are higher, it's going to reduce demand for credit, it's going to reduce demand for buying things, and it's going to reduce the um, economic activity in a country. If the economic activity is reduced, then prices have to go down because there's just not as much demand for stuff. And if you re increase the interest rate on your credit card, uh, that's, gonna, that's what it's going to cause. The actual reason is that when you lend your money out, if the rate of inflation is 7% and all you can get at your bank is 1%, you're going to need to buy an inflation hedge. And Michael illustrated that very well in his presentation that um, we've seen inflation in farmland prices. Why? Because institutional investors have realized that farmland is a good hedge against inflation. So instead of keeping their money in the bank at, well, in this case, in the previous slide at 4.5%, uh, you put your money into farmland at seven, 6 to 7% a year. So if somebody wants to borrow that money from you instead, no, don't buy the farmland, lend it to me, I need to build a crush plant. You're going to have to pay them a rate that competes with the farmland's uh, rate of return, right? So, so that's why when inflation is high, um, the interest rates normally have to go higher to compensate investors for that risk. So the anxiety that we're feeling in the current market is related to the relationship over time of interest rates to inflation. The last time that inflation spiked the way it is, the response by the central bank was to raise interest rates above the rate of inflation. In the 1980s, it was 14% and interest rates went to 17%. That's scary. That's what's scaring the market, right? Because we're here at 4.5% interest and inflation is at 77 Right? So that's cause of anxiety. That's a headwind for commodities because the idea is that we're going to have to raise it to at least 7.7% or more, right? And I don't know. I mean, the inflation could come down, the interest rates could come up, we could meet somewhere in the middle, but that's the anxiety. Oh, wheat. Let's just wrap this up for a minute. So, uh, so I just, that's the overall kind of overarching macro, macro in economic environment. And it doesn't matter for grain prices every day, but some days the market will just bleh, and it'll just puke everywhere. And it'll be like, what's going on? <laughs> oh, it'll, it, interest rates, right, right. It, it'll just randomly happen, and, and that's a risk that we have. It can be an opportunity as well, depending on how you're positioned, um, but that is sometimes what we see is what we call these macro market meltdowns, 
and they can be quite scary. So specific to wheat, um, in this case, I'm going to talk about the, the Black Sea and overall global wheat supplies. The initial reaction to the, the war in the Black Sea when Russia invaded Ukraine, the world... At that time, Ukraine and Russia together were one-third of global wheat exports. Actually, they, they still are pretty much one-third. Uh, Russia has actually just increased its share and has uh, undercut Ukraine. Ukraine's share of global exports. But in any case, the, the market was really worried, and they thought that Russia and Ukraine's wheat exports would go to zero. So 33% would be erased, and they had to scramble. Wheat buyers had, had purchased wheat from Ukraine and Russia. They were scrambling to find other uh, sources, other origins. They went to the United States. Well, guess what? In North America, we just had a drought in 2021, and uh, it wasn't there either. So naturally, wheat prices went up. Um, wheat is a, an interesting commodity because it's human food, first and foremost. 80% approximately globally of, of wheat is used for human consumption. So when people get worried about putting food on their plates, they freak out every time. When wheat gets political, it gets crazy. And that's what happened. It got political. War is politics by other means. I think was a famous military general said that, Clausewitz. Um, that was extreme politics and extreme wheat volatility. So what's happened since then is that uh, we learned that Ukraine was able to export some grain through uh, river, uh, river ports um, over by rail, by truck. Ukraine was able to get some wheat out. Russia didn't stop. Russia kept on pumping wheat out. Um, they have been supplying a lot of their allies in the Middle East and in Africa. That hasn't stopped. And uh, the market slowly realized that wheat flow hadn't quite stopped. It had just been disrupted. It had been, there was a risk premium that came into the wheat market. So what we found is that the risk premium didn't need to be 5 or $6 a bushel, you know, creating a $16 a bushel wheat price. That risk premium is more like 1 or 2 And any time that there's an, um, uh, kind of a, an issue in the Black Sea, you add risk premium. And any time that you have a reduction in risk, such as the, um, the export deal that was recently signed, the risk premium comes out. And it's interesting. Well, the other issue that we have to deal with in several months is a, a drought in the United States. The United States has very tight wheat stocks right now. And uh, in North America, anyway, the, the, this is a real risk, right? So uh, the U.S. market has to maintain a sufficient premium to global prices such that it doesn't export any more grain because it needs that wheat at home. It has very tight stocks because of the drought that was in Kansas last year, and they're still under a drought. So it's been good for Canada, actually, because we have a lot of wheat, and uh, we've been exporting very, very nice uh, at a high rate. Uh, it's not enough to rally prices to new highs, but it's enough to say that you know, we should have a very good year for wheat prices in this country. Um, one thing I would say, though, is that one thing I've heard of, oh, volatility. There's so much volatility. Volatility is the new norm. There's going to be more volatility. You know, if there's one commodity where there might not be, it's wheat. It's because we have now 120 days where Russia and Ukraine are exporting. We've got probably 120 days before we have to deal with this drought. And uh, we may just have a very boring wheat market for the next little while. Volatility may not be the norm for wheat. So... Keep that in your mind. Uh, soybeans. Let's talk about soybeans. Uh, I want to talk about a little bit about South America and soybeans, but um, for South American weather, soybeans is the most important. When you look at this chart, you might say, oh, well, what's the big deal? Why is everybody worried about soybeans? Why are they $14.50 a bushel? Why, is canola, why are oil seeds so expensive? Why is canola... Um, 19 or $20 a bushel. Well, yeah, this chart looks fine. Prices should go down. Well, that's information. This is insight. Most of that soybean production is coming from South America. Brazil, big, big dog there. Uh, what is that? 152 million tons of beans. U.S. production last year is about 120. Brazil beats that. Then you've got Argentina with another 50 or so. 
and Paraguay is becoming an important producer as well. So all of a sudden you're like, oh boy, well, how's the Brazilian crop doing? How, how are they doing in South America? Oh, they're not even seeded yet. <laughs> We're betting on a record crop, and I don't mean just record, record acres. They're not even seeded. Record yield. They have barely even started growing the, the crop. Are we sure that they're going to get a record crop? I don't know. That's why uh, Michael said as well in his presentation, farmers are, farm sentiment is low right now because input costs are high, but we're not sure what the prices are going to be. If they get a record crop in South America, prices probably go down. But if they don't, prices go up. Uncertainty creates that uh, anxiety. So what's happening there? Well, uh, so far in, in Brazil, it looks pretty good. Mato Grosso has record acres. Mato Grosso is the top growing state in Brazil for beans. Uh, last year, though, there was a drought related to what's called La Nina. La Nina tends to create dry conditions in Argentina and southern Brazil. What does this map show? That orange blob over Argentina and southern Brazil? That's a moisture deficit forecast for the month of December. So already we're starting to build some uncertainty and probably some weather risk premium into South America. I don't know, you know, this is a forecast, right? Who knows? Ask Drew Lerner. Uh, I'm not a weather guy, but it does look to me like there should be some risk premium, and I think there is in the, in the oil seed market. Uh, again, this could be a lot worse. We don't see any red. See on the bottom there that, that uh, spectrum? Uh, if it was deep red or, or almost purple, that would be a really scary result. And so far, it's just a mild deficit. And uh, normally in Argentina and Brazil, they get know, a, a bit of rain every day, almost. So it, it might not be an issue, right? But I'm just saying we need to really pay attention to the weather in South America this year. It's going to be of utmost importance. Um, La Nina, this is the probability that the U.S. government presents for La Nina. La Nina, again, is the condition that causes dry weather in South America. La Nina uh, has a in Feb, March, April, has a 40% chance of, uh, of, of, of developing in the, in the South America. And just so happens that in our market sense recommendations, we're recommending to be 60% uh, sold on canola or having 40% exposed to the market. And so, you know, it's not just because of this, but it kind of roughly correlates. That's, that's some of the ways that we, um, that we adjust our position based on the, the risk. Um, of, of weather events and that sort of thing. And then finally, um, I wanted to talk about, a little bit about biodiesel. And the main thing I wanted to talk about on this slide is that uh, far on the left, on the left you see U.S. soybean oil use by type. Non-biofuel use is flat. That's the blue line on top. Uh, but biofuel use for bean oil is rising very quickly. So what I'm getting at there is that uh, there's a very good news story for veg oil. So it's not all doom and gloom. Um, there's a reason why we're building crushed plants hand over fist in the United States and Canada. It's because of this biofuel uh, outlook. And, and that is expected to continue. So market sense, how market sense views the market. Uh, there's some macro and financial market headwinds. Um, there's speculators that are jumping into and out of the market for inflation purposes, for other purposes other than and farming and crop production that we have to deal with. Weather and supplies are far from certain in the Black Sea, South America, Kansas drought. There is demand destruction that's happening. We're seeing it in the, in the Durham market, for instance. Uh, there's not as much uh, Durham being used for pasta. Uh, on the other side, though, there's, there's good biodiesel demand. So it's a pretty confusing world out there. And uh, oftentimes when I give a presentation like this, I find out afterwards that there's been a few people in the audience that have given up all their worldly possessions and joined the monastery. Um, becoming a monk is a way of managing risk. Yeah, that is a way. <laughs> Luckily, it's not the only way. We have at Cargill something called a minimum price put. So that's an option that we have. We offer to uh, clients and farmers. We offer it through the Cargill Risk Management Desk, which is based in Minneapolis. Cargill Risk Management Desk works with multinational corporations, um, end users, uh, crush plants, food companies, and farmers to create and manage, create uh, structured products, structured financial products to manage market risk. 
We have that offered to the Canadian farmer. Um, there's a portfolio. There's a lot of different products. I'm going to talk to you about one. And these products, specifically the minimum price put, we use at market sense very frequently over the last 20 years. We've used it with great success to manage farm risk and create that custom marketing plan based on your risk tolerance. The minimum price put is a risk off product. It, it re re removes price risk. How does it do so? It puts a floor price in for a grain. And when I mean floor, I mean it. I mean floor. It eliminates downside futures risk. It gives you a floor price, but the great part about it is, is you're not locking in a futures or a basis component on that grain contract. Therefore, if the market goes up, if the futures market goes up, you still get that higher price. You, you can lock that price in, that higher price. But if the futures market goes down, you have a floor, a worst case scenario locked in. Production risk is good too. Because you're not locking in a basis and a futures, your buyout on those components is minimized and the only risk to you is the actual cost of the minimum price put. So I'm going to tell you a story about how I used it, or, well, I didn't use it, how a client and I partnered together to use this risk management product. This is that Western that we were talking about. I'm just going to shuffle some pages around here to make sure that I give you all the, the juicy details. So I had to write them down. <laughs> it's a good story. All right. All right, so put yourself in my situation. I'm driving down the road. It's blowing wind. It's the middle of June last year. Blowing wind, dust. My lips are super chapped. I wanted to rip them right off my face. Uh, I was dabbing the sweat off my brow. Part of it, I was just nervous because I knew I was going to see uh, my client. Um, let's, let's call him Jeff. He's in southern Saskatchewan. And uh, we had recently made a canola recommendation so it's hot, but I'm also like, oh boy, this guy's not going to be happy about this. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's that's kind of what things looked like around that time. That's not a canola field. This is a canola story, but uh, this is this is approximately what it looked like there in, in June. Um, so I pull up to the farm, and so let's just back up here. Jeff was uh, he's about 50 years old. He's He's got a lot of years on the farm left. Well, I've been working for, with him for about five or six years now. And uh, he uh, is a stone face. Like, he doesn't show any emotion. Uh, 70 bushel canola, flat faced. Oh, yeah. 20 bushel bar barley, no, yeah, it would be worse. Um, Jeff doesn't show any emotion. This time, though, he, he kind of he kind of was actually I'll, I'll be honest see we had made some really good decisions this year we uh, correctly anticipated an inflationary environment um, I remember in the summer of 2020 uh, we were doing CERB you know direct cash payments into people's bank accounts for not working and um, we were in the states they were doing stimulus checks to everybody just to everybody and I was like well this is inflationary let's make sure that you put some of your retained earnings into real assets so we took on some debt, bought some bins, uh, bought some land. He upgraded some equipment. You know, he, he levered up in a low interest rate environment that was clearly going to turn inflationary. So we made a good call. Uh, it, was a, it was a good strategic decision for the farm. But then we went into a drought in 2021, and that was tough on cash flow. Now, round two. So yeah, stone-faced Jeff was feeling a little nervous. <laughs> That's not Jeff, <laughs> but that's how he was looking at me when I was sitting across the table telling him to sell 50% of his canola. You feel lucky, do you? <laughs> that's basically what he said to me. Um, and I said, okay, no, we don't have to sell 50% of your canola, just sell it at the market. We're going to use, or I'm going to ask you to use uh, what's called a minimum price put. And, and he knew what it was. I had presented it to him before. Kind of a risk-averse guy. Never wanted to get too fancy. This, in his mind, was fancy. But, you know, it was, it was a special situation. So he, he listened to me. And uh, I laid it out for him. So canola, June 14th. $1,040 a ton. 
That was the price of canola that day. The cost of the minimum price put then was $78. Okay, so the, the floor price for his canola was $1,040, but the cost of the tool was $78. So the, the effective floor was $962 a ton, or $21.80 a bushel in a market that was currently trading at $2,360. So already you're kind of like, oh, I don't want to take a lower price than what the market's at. Okay, our, 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 we had gone through the reasoning as to why we thought the market may have downside risk. Speculators were exiting. There was fundamental reasons that for Mark Canola to go up, but the reality was is that the macro market meltdown was, was more risky. And uh, I said, well, okay, do you want to just sell the canola? Well, no. We had already sold 15% a few months earlier, and he was feeling very nervous about that. And that was sold at a higher price. Okay, so you're, you're not going to sell any more, but we're really worried about downside risk. What if we put a floor price in and, and this is what we did? Floor price, 21.80. So we all know what happened in the canola market. Middle of June, she starts coming down. The speculators dump their positions. It doesn't matter that it's dry in Canada. Uh, there was an exodus from all commodities at that time. Macro market meltdown. I called him in July. The market was now trading at around 780. Canola kind of looked like this. Hey, Jeff, you want to sell any more? What are you thinking? <laughs> He's at the lake. He's like, no, not a, not a chance. I'm at the lake. I don't care. Um, but do we still got that, minute, that floor? Is the floor price locked in? Yes, Jeff, it's locked in. Don't you worry about that. That is a guarantee. All right. So fast forward to September. And there was a couple showers, random showers. Anyway, things had, on that farm had, uh, had been OK uh, late, later on that year. And he was pulling off 38 bushels in September. And that was really great. Of course, he was stone-faced. I was happy. He was stone-faced. But he was pulling off 30. We thought he was going to do sub-20 earlier that year. But the market was trading at 800. He's like, Ed, the market or the, uh, the elevator wants it now. They want me to deliver this grain now. How do we do this price floor thingy? <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, that's, that's cute. Um, I said, OK, what you want to do, you know, you've got this minimum price put at Cargill. Call your elevator, sell the grain at the market price, which was $18.15 a bushel, $800 a ton. I'm going to go to work, and I'm going to unwind the minimum price put portion of that contract. Remember, he had a floor at 1,040. Okay, the market's trading at 800. So the value of that of that product now is 240 dollars a ton. All right, that's added to the 800 bucks that the market's trading at. Now it cost him 78, right? So then that's the subtraction. The floor price, surprise, surprise, is exactly what we said before: 2180. A bushel, or $962 a ton. Wonderful. The market's $18.15, $21.80 a bushel. He had locked in some $24 canola earlier that year, but you know, and this is how I knew, this is how I knew Stone Face Jeff really was happy, is he called me and said, Ed, um, you know, that's, that re worked really out really well. It's funny because this canola actually makes me feel better than the 23 canola or the, the 24 the $24 canola that we locked in back in April or May it was. I was like, really? You're getting less money. You're telling me it feels better? And he said, yeah, it, it actually does because I was more stressed than he was. He was calling me a lot about that $24 canola, um, worried that he was going to have to buy it out. But this stuff, he never had to worry about buyouts. And, and, and so he was more stressed about the higher price canola than he was about the stuff that he had on the minimum price put. So that risk management that we engaged in, that tool that we engaged in, um, allowed him to protect the profit using the tools and the strategies and the insights that we at MarketSense had provided. He was able to execute a strategy that protected his profit at a risk tolerance level that fit his personality, that fit his operation. And that's what we do. Risk management. And I also needed a transition slide. So risk management, underline. 
Uh, at Cargill, we've done a little bit of, um, of uh, industry surveys. We, we surveyed 800 farmers a, a couple of years ago, and we asked them uh, uh, several questions about grain marketing to try to figure out if there's a demand for the product that we're selling. Um, we learned that farmers use a lot of marketing information sources. 82% use uh, daily grain text from the grain companies. Um, no, local elevator newsletters, industry newsletters, government reports, advice from neighbors, Coffee Row. Uh, paid subscription to industry uh, information and uh, what we do, which is paid independent grain marketing advisor, 19%. And so we said, oh, okay, well, you know, there's obviously uh, you know, some room for us to grow there. Um, number of sources used when making grain marketing decisions. I don't even know how to read that. I guess the way I look at it is roughly 40% of farmers use four or more sources of grain marketing information. That's kind of getting back to what I said earlier. How do you cut through the noise, right? When you've got all that information coming at you. This is, this is something I really found interesting. Um, farmers, uh, we asked them, 800 of them, we asked them, um, what's your overall knowledge of grain marketing? And 90% said good or in-depth. So up, oh, that's, that's great, right? Good or in-depth understanding of grain marketing, that's, that's excellent. Um, the, the interesting thing is when we asked them how they felt about grain marketing, 55% of those with good and, and in-depth understanding found it stressful. So they had a good understanding and, it, you know, they were still stressed about it. So we feel at MarketSense we've got the ability to, to flip that. We think that we can, using the tools and the strategy, using the partnership with a, with a, with a team that's been around for a long time, that's learned a lot of lessons. Cargill's been around for 150 years. Market Sense has been around for 20. We think that we can change that stressful category to enjoyable. See, enjoyable is only 21%. We really think, and think about when you're using tools, right? You're using a hammer that's bent, or like a really dull handsaw, or a pipe wrench as a hammer, and like, this isn't working, this sucks. <laughs> well, yeah, because you're not using the right tools for the job, but when you're using like a really nice, sharp diamond blade DeWalt, and it's, oh, it's just cutting through that, plywood like butter, this is enjoyable. I can do this. And so that's what we think. We, we have the tools at Market Sense to help the farmer do the job and do the marketing job in a way that's enjoyable. And, and think about what we're doing um, going forward. Well, well, first of all, I'll say our job, Market Sense is how. Remember I, I said that's what I want. I almost forgot. But I'm going to remind you, market sense is how. We want to cut through the noise. Market sense is how you find true insight and how you gain marketing confidence. And we need that confidence, right? Because this year we're going to put in the most expensive crop ever. How are we going to turn the most expensive crop ever into a profit? I believe that market sense is how. Thank you for your time. Let's do some questions. I am, yeah. How do I? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Use the QR code or enter the uh, 8199-6642 number into your browser. And uh, then you can ask me a question. <laughs> That's what it's going to take. <laughs> I like the system, though. The system's good. It, it is. And, and I remember I was able to read the other people's questions yesterday with Michael, and, and that helped me in my presentation today. So that was good. Yeah. You did a really good job of explaining everything. <laughs> awesome. I think Mike came up there. Yeah, I, I thought I saw something. Our oats going to come back. Um, the. The, the market ingredients aren't there for an oat rally, certainly not to last year's highs. Uh, you need to see something different, something uh, materially different in the supply and demand scenario. Um, with oats right now, <clears throat> you do have a supportive fundamental factor, which is that feed prices are quite high. Barley, feed wheat, 
you know, sub substitute feed grains, though, um, are high. So there's a pull for oats into the feed, feed supply chain. Now, oats don't necessarily just translate directly into a, into a feed ration, right? So th they typically trade at a discount to other feed grains. The reality is, though, is that there's oats to sell. Um, last year, there wasn't. There was a terrible drought. And so you had farmers canceling contracts, and uh, the oats weren't there. There wasn't a natural seller in the market. So um, I guess what I, would, what I would say is when you say, are oats going to come back? I remember they were trading at $4 a few months ago. Now they've come up to 5 So you, you could argue, I would argue, that they have come back, some. Um, I do not think they're going to come back to all-time highs. Did you exercise the put options or sell them to gain the time value? What about the rest of the unsold canola? And so uh, as far as that farmer in particular, he's up to recommendations now at 60%. He sold some. Uh, we recently made some recommendations a, few, a couple of weeks ago, uh, so he sold some more into that. I don't know exactly where he's, he's sold you know, and how, where his prices are, because um, we, we have a, another advisor that's taken over the account um, as I've taken over the analyst role. Did we exercise the put option? So it was not a put option. It was a minimum price put. That's a difference. It's a structured product that's offered by Cargill Risk Management. So Cargill holds their hedging position. They may use options in the exchange-traded market to hedge their position. They may not. Uh, Cargill Risk Management builds this product that behaves very similar to how a, an exchange traded put is traded, but there is no exercise. It's cash, it's cash settled. So, um, so no there's, there's no, there's no exercising of the options. There's no futures positions trading hands. Uh, it's all done through Cargill's risk management desk. When the conflict between Russia and Ukraine ends, will we see massive market swings? Yes. <laughs> so it, it, <laughs> it, it really depends on uh, how much grain is like backlogged, right? And so I think that we will because I think that there's been a backlog of grain that's kind of trapped in Ukraine. It's also probably trapped in Russia because they're having trouble getting boats and things like that. So, so there's a good chance that when it ends that grain will suddenly become available to the market. The issue, though, is that uh, well, when's it going to end, right? That, that's the key point there. Uh, I don't, it doesn't appear to me it's going to end anytime soon. So, um, How does Market Sense ensure that all advisors are on the same page? Who does the analysis? I do the analysis, and I ensure that they're on the same page. Well, it's not just me. We have a team. I have a team. I have two ana analysts that I work with. There's an analyst team, and uh, we coordinate and produce uh, weekly, daily, monthly content to make sure that everybody's getting the same up-to-date information. It goes to the advisors, and it also goes to the farmer's inbox. So that's how we do it. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you for your time, everyone. It was a pleasure.